It's a new year, so a good opportunity to clear the air. Uh, you've acknowledged today you didn't get everything right and that you understand the frustration people have felt over the summer. But do you want to take this opportunity to actually say sorry for the mistakes you've made as Prime Minister? Not just about uh, COVID, everything from going to Hawaii during the bushfires through to not having uh, enough rapid antigen tests in place, even as you foreshadowed the switch to a greater use of them, and for failing to live up to your pledge to hundreds of thousands of people on the NDIS that you will make sure the scheme was fully funded, uncapped and demand-driven. And will you uh, apologise to people who've had... the hundreds of people who've had funding arbitrarily cut under the scheme? Well, thanks for the question. <laughs> Always happy to ask you questions, Prime Minister. Yep. We're all terribly sorry for what this pandemic has done to the world and to this country. These are the times in which we live, and I've set out today, I think, very clearly the challenges that we've faced. But I'm also very proud of Australians and what they've achieved in enabling us all to come through this despite the setbacks and the challenges that we have faced. In terms of the things, when I say we haven't got everything right, let me reflect on a couple of them for you. First of all, as we went into this summer, we were optimistic. I was optimistic. We are all desperately looking forward to a great summer. And one of the things we learn again is that the virus has a way of bringing you back to earth. And I don't think as we went into the summer, I think we were too optimistic perhaps. And we could have communicated more clearly about the risks and challenges that we still faced. And I think in raising those expectations about the summer, that we heightened the great sense of disappointment that people felt. And as we had to make massive changes because of Omicron. As I said, the rapid antigen tests had only actually even been approved for use by the TGA earlier in November. We'd agreed at the meeting of National Cabinet about how they'd be funded and who had to go and get them. And so we, we moved quickly because we hadn't anticipated that we would have a variant that resulted in the vaccine not being able to stop the transmission. We had invested so much, and Australians had invested so much, in getting those vaccinations. And over November and December, we were focused on the booster program, the children's program, and at the same time, Omicron came and completely turned things on its head. So we moved quickly, and I've set out the steps that we've taken to work that around. And in our communications, we have to be clear about that, because we can't lift people's hopes and then disappoint them. And I think that's what happened over the break. Secondly, on the vaccination program, if I had my time over, I would have put it under a military operation from the outset and not later in the year. We'd all worked up the plan together, been through cabinet, our cabinet, been through the national cabinet. We'd set out the timetables. We'd had the, the goal of ensuring that everyone who wanted a vaccine could be offered one by October, for the record that was achieved on the 25th of October. And as we went through those early months and we had the challenges that we have with the health department and us dealing with many, many issues, I took the decision to send in General Fruin and change the way we did it and set up a ch change in the command structure, how logistics were managed, how it was planned, and it worked. But I wish we'd done that earlier. And that's a lesson. In the aged care sector, we knew, well, I should say, we learned that the interface between the aged care sector and the public hospital system was blurred. And so when the storms of COVID hit, that created some real challenges. And in the aged care sector, and I remember it was one of the hardest days of the pandemic, with St Basil's and we had a whole health workforce stood down because of COVID rules, so understand that, but left an aged care facility with no staff. 
and I had to send the military in that night. The interface and whether patients could be moved and how and when from aged care facilities into hospital cities, private and public, that, that emerged earlier in the pandemic. And so that could have been done better between both the states and ourselves. But as you can see, these are not simple issues with simple solutions. They're complex and events can work against you. But what I say to Australians on every occasion where something hasn't been gone exactly as we'd hoped or we've got it exactly right or how, how way we would like to have turned out, we've crushed together, worked the problem, solved it and moved forward. And that's what Australians expect of us. I don't think they expect perfection, but they do expect you to keep working it every single day. And that's something I'm very proud my government has done. Now on the NDIS, we are fully funding the NDIS. It's one of my great passions, as people know in this place. And I will never let people down if I can help it in the NDIS. It's a huge program. It's a program that is well expanded beyond what the Productivity Commission said it would, well beyond. The design of it and how it was set up has contributed massively to the costs and those designs. Um, we're not having much success in convincing those uh, at state level, and Commonwealth level, and then through the parliament as to how that can be best managed. It's going to be a big challenge in the years ahead, the NDIS, but people know I'm totally committed to it. So you don't have to say sorry about any of those things? I think I've explained my answer fairly fully.